um, we were getting, we were been fielding questions from clients. So we thought we'd just answer, or tell you a few things that clients are asking us. So a couple of things. Um, one of the questions we've received would be, well, what about if no work or materials are furnished in a particular period? Do we still have to issue as a contractor a uh, invoice at least every 31 days? Um, and our view is that no, there is nothing in the act that says you have to issue nil invoices. It doesn't even refer to nil invoices. And when you look at what's to be in a proper invoice, a proper invoice to be proper actually has to refer to the work that's been performed or the materials furnished. So our view is that no, you would not have to submit nil invoices. Um, not that you couldn't agree to do so, but you'd have to, if, if that was important to the parties, then you should specify that in the actual contract terms. Um, when it comes to uh, sort of the litigation type provisions in your commercial contracts, one of the things that we're doing right now is we're revising those types of provisions. So let's say you typically like to use a CCDC form. It doesn't have mandatory arbitration. Some of our clients, though, have change those provisions and saying, well, we want our disputes to be mandatory other than, of course, you know, builders liens that have to be filed at the courthouse anyways, um, or at land titles, and then a, a statement, um, uh, an action commenced. But we're saying to clients, well, you can't agree for everything to be mandatory arbitration. Like you can't contract out of the Prompt Payment um, and Construction Lien Act anymore. And again, that's for all contracts entered into after August 29th. So what we're doing is just to clarify that so the parties understand that we're adding language to what might be a, an arbitration clause or, or a litigation clause that says something like, you know, subject to um, the adjudication provisions of the Prompt Payment and Construction Lien Act, any other disputes that aren't, you know, that aren't subject to adjudication can be determined by arbitration or go to the court. So that that would be something to take a look at in your, your main contract or your supplementary general conditions. Certainly, almost all contracts we've been working on need updates, both in the um, prime contract and in the subcontracts to ensure that one in the, you know, the main construction contract there's the requirement to issue the proper invoice at least every 31 days by the contractor. And then there is language now requiring the owner to pay those invoices within 28 days, subject to the owner otherwise issuing a form one. So that would be language we would be putting in. And for um, subcontract agreements as well, you might want to be adding in language to the effect that uh, the contractor agrees that, you know, provided it's been paid by the owner um, within 28 days of every proper invoice, it shall pay its subcontractor within seven days, again, subject to the contractor issuing a Form 2 or a Form 3 within 35 days of the proper invoice, and likewise down the contractual chain. The other thing that we've been... Um, you know, working on with clients is uh, looking at whether they actually bring all of the detailed adjudication timelines into their contracts or not. We have some clients with, you know, really large projects where they want every obligation that could possibly exist in the contract. And so we'll draft really long provisions that essentially take the adjudication timelines and all the steps the parties take if a matter goes to adjudication and put that in the contract. Also the concept of proper invoice, that's not going to be in any contracts uh, before August 29th. So we're adding in you know, a definition of proper invoice. Again, um, some clients prefer that all the requirements that are in a proper invoice are set out you know, in a schedule to the agreement or in the body of the agreement. Some clients like the keep it simple principle and they'd rather just have the definition, say a proper invoice, you know, means an invoice that meets the requirement of the of the act. So looking at those types of definitions, uh, we are also, um, you know, looking at the lean period language. So uh, while some contracts will just say, you know, the holdback is in accordance with the legislation that will still work. 
But if you actually had a reference to 45 days and it now needs to be 60, you need to be looking at that and making sure it reflects the new lean period. Um, and as well, if um, the improvement is primarily re related to concrete, then you need to think about saying that in your con contract and referring to a 90 day lean period. Uh, we think it's going to be, you know, this transition period will be probably most difficult for subcontractors actually, um, because, you know, they're not a party to the prime. They won't necessarily automatically know whether the prime was signed before August 29th or after. So a key question for all subcontractors now when you're entering into subcontract agreements will be that you need to know the date of that prime contract. And you should actually be specifying in your subcontract um, whether or not the new prompt payment uh, provisions uh, apply or not. Because certainly if the prime contract is dated before August 29th, then they don't. And you would be subject to the shorter 45 day lean period, not the 60 day. Um, parties, of course, can amend their contracts. So I'm sure we'll have some general contractors who have maybe a fair amount of uh, negotiating power who might be able to convince owners for prime contracts that are still going on today and that were signed before August 29th, that maybe they'll agree to amend those contracts to bring them into force um, so that prompt payment and adjudication and the new lien periods could apply to that project, but without an amendment, they're not required to. Um, we also talked about the certificate of substantial performance. So again, if you want to be issuing that electronically, that would have to be stated in the contract as well. Um, we have taken the forms. So again, there's forms one through 15 that are included in a regulation to the new legislation. Um, they're pretty straightforward. For the most part, we think owners and contractors probably could fill out the form one through five, the various dispute notices themselves. Of course, you may you want your counsel helping you, you know, filling them out, uh, looking at, you know, helping you with the reasons, um, but they're fairly straightforward. Forms six through 15 are for the most part forms that um, the statements of lien and various affidavits, and for the most part, you'll probably be working with counsel on those forms. Um, for any of our clients that are on the call, we have taken all those forms, we put them into Word, um, and we have them available uh, if you want to reach out to anyone of a member of our construction team for your use. Uh, we also just a shout out to the Edmonton Construction Association. They have some really good um, FAQs on their website. They do also have an unofficial uh, black line. Uh, it was prepared by another law firm that acted for industry, but that's a really good place for looking for uh, questions that you may have, uh, you know, that you may have that there may be answers to. Matt, maybe a couple of other things that you've been answering for clients? Some of the things that we've been answering. Um, one of the questions people are asking is what happens if there's a non-payment? Um, and typically the remedy um, is that interest begins to accrue. Interest will start accruing and it's at the Judgment Interest Act rate unless it specifies some other form of interest um, in your contract. So you'll want, depending on the position you take, um, sorry, the position you're in, whether you're the owner, the contractor, the subcontractor, you might have a different view of what that interest rate should be because in the event that there's a late payment, um, you would start to accrue that interest. Um, I have been receiving that practical question is what if we're late by a few days and you make we then make that payment. Um, in the end, it's the interest that will accrue and we don't really know what type of costs penalties could be um, associated with commencing an, an adjudication. We, obviously, we haven't had anybody run an adjudication here in Alberta yet. So whether or not a, a subcontractor or the contractor starts the adjudication process and they have to go through the effort of preparing their documents and submitting it, and then the owner or the contractor ahead of them makes payment, um, the owner of the contractor may say that your, your remedy is the interest. Um, but I anticipate that people will be requesting some form of cost award for their time and effort, whether or not that 
has any ground or standing. Um, it it uh, is unknown, but it's akin to filing a statement of claim. And then um, you serve the other party and they say, no, 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 we want to pay. We, we, we were prepared to pay this invoice. Um, and we frequently will take the position, well, you need to pay some costs for the work that was associated with filing a statement of claim. Um, another question that's been asked every once in a while is whether or not the concept of payment certification will be removed from CCDC contracts. Um, I think it will to the extent that it does not relate to testing and commissioning. The follow-up question by everybody is what constitutes testing and commissioning? Um, I think that it's undefined in the act. Um, and I think it's going to have a practical sense when it comes to testing and commissioning, such as electrical, uh, gas, plumbing, things that actually require testing and commissioning, and then on larger projects, obviously, startup. Um, so I, I think that's one interesting question that people have been having. Um, I think I'm missing one. Is there one I'm missing? It was obvious. Um, I know on the startup um, testing commissioning, like uh, another thing to do while we're sort of waiting to see if there's any, you know, will there be any sort of litigation or interpretation about what that means, other than obviously what, what's practical makes sense is you can be creating also a specific definite various definitions in your contract. So on large projects, we'll create multiple different definitions for, you know, testing, you know, and commissioning for phase one means this, you know, of the work or testing and commissioning for scope X, Y, Z means this. And so the parties are not likely to have a dispute when they've actually negotiated that in their contract. And um, th that's the point. We don't, we don't want to have surprises. So the more you can draft into your contract about what the parties think testing and commissioning means uh, will go a long way to avoiding a dispute about that. Um, I think one other thing that we uh, have been uh, talking about was the concept of draft invoices. Oh, right. Draft invoices. So when it, some of the owners have been asking whether or not they can put a provision in their contract requesting draft invoices. Um, I've been I've been suggesting that this is a prudent practice because, um, as we all know, that sometimes there's issues with invoices or supporting documentation is missing. So that's that's a, a good way of making sure that the process continues on smoothly. So the. I think we came up with the easiest way, everybody's different, of course, but one of the easiest ways is to fix your date in your contract for the date that invoices are due and the dates when a draft invoice is due, whether it falls three business days before the, 20, before the first of the next month, which is 31 days, um, or whether or not it has to happen the Friday before but whatever works for your organization, but I think draft invoices could really help this, this process go smoothly. Yeah, and certainly um, as Matt has said, like the construction legislation in Ontario, uh, quite a few of us have been working on lots of projects in Ontario, a lot of mine expansion and industrial projects. And so big contracts where we're working on customized contracts for those projects, uh, we have been including for owners, the draft invoicing concepts going into um, you know, details, so not a proper invoice, but what needs to be in those invoices, and then giving the parties time to hopefully resolve any issues on the draft before the contractor shall issue the proper invoice and seems to be working really well. You do have to have, you know, sufficient team to be able to not only generate a draft and then the final, and you have to have the, enough people who are able to then put their minds to those proper invoices every month to try resolve any issues before the proper invoice has to be issued. But uh, yeah, we've, uh, we've, we've had quite a good success with that on large contracts. Um, I think again, for anybody using CCDCs or your own bespoke agreements, just it's, this is, we're doing a lot of work in the area, updating clients, SGCs, um, to ensure that they comply with the new rules for any contracts entered into on or after August 29th. Um, for filing liens, I think, Matt, we had, you and I had talked about how before any lien is filed now, it'll also be really important to know before you're filing the lien, what's the date of the prime contract, because that affects 
well, are you the 45 days or you're the 60 days? So those access rights, particularly for a subcontractor, will be really important because if you don't know whether the prime contract was entered into before August 29th or not, you're going to need to find out. And if you're, dispute, if you're in a dispute with the contractor and they won't produce it, you may very well need to demand that from the owner under the new access rights as well. I have nothing further unless you do. Yeah, no, I think that covers a lot of the questions that we've been fielding. We're uh, really happy to be able to present to you today on some pretty major changes in the construction industry. We hope that for you know, the industry that these changes do in fact achieve the goals of uh, prompt payment for everyone along the chain and hopefully quicker resolution to disputes so that again, everybody can be focused on achieving their milestones and completion of the work and uh, you know, essentially uh, enjoying a really great contractual working relationship with everybody on the construction team. Thanks again from Matt and I, it was a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks everybody.